God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours in the Son of Mary, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The text for the sermon tonight is taken from the Gospel, which we'll hear a little bit later in our worship service. Let us start with a prayer. O oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth would speak your truth, the truth of Emmanuel, God with us, born as Mary's Son, our brother, Savior, and King, Jesus Christ. Dear friends in Christ, the story is told of a distinguished British preacher visiting the United States for the first time with what he thought was a carefully constructed and oh-so-clever three-point sermon on the word but. No one, though, told him that in America, but with two T's, means this. <laughs> so the distinguished homiletician mounted the pulpit in a prestigious East Coast church, and in great deductive style, he stated his first point, everyone has a butt. <laughs> Oblivious as to why there was laughter in the congregation, he continued, to point two, you can see other people's butts. <laughs> By now the congregation is laughing like you, but he did not understand why he was British. His third point, but you can't see your own butt, brought the house down. I hope this chuckle will remind you of the point of my sermon tonight. That Christmas is God's answer to all your buts. With one T. It's always been God's answer to people's buts. Going back to the first Christmas, starting with an elderly priest by the name of Zechariah. In his day, there were so many priests in Israel that they only got to serve in Jerusalem approximately two weeks out of each year. And while they were there serving in Jerusalem at the temple complex, every day those there serving would draw lots to see who would have the honor of actually going inside the building. One of them would get a chance to go inside the building each day and offer the incense offering. The lot fell to aged Zechariah, finally, probably after a lifetime of service. But as he entered the temple to do his service, he met suddenly the angel Gabriel, who told him that the Lord had chosen him and his wife Elizabeth, also elderly, to now finally, at this late stage in life, have their first child, a son, who would go by the name John and prepare a people for the coming of Christ. But that's exactly when Zechariah's big old butt got in the way. Because he said to the angel, but we're too old. The next person with a butt at Christmas was Joseph, not a priest just a carpenter, but a carpenter who happened to have as an ancestor in his family tree, King David. And this Joseph, related to King David, was engaged to a nice girl, also of the house and line of David, named Mary. But she was found to be with child before they were wed. That's a pretty tough butt to swallow at Christmas. Not just because it was an unplanned pregnancy, but because the baby was definitely not his. And not just because Mary said she was a virgin, but because the Bible told us that Joseph was a righteous man. And what that meant back then, among other things, is that Joseph took seriously God's sixth commandment 
about keeping oneself chaste before marriage. So the baby couldn't possibly be his. What Joseph didn't take seriously, though, was Mary's explanation that the Father was the Holy Spirit. This he could not buy, so he went to bed one night, convinced that while he didn't want to hurt her or humiliate her, which is another thing righteous people did back then, even though they were hurt and humiliated, he decided he was going to have to divorce her quietly. Like I said, that's a tough butt to have to sleep on before Christmas. The next person with a butt at the first Christmas may not even have been a real person. May not have existed. I'm talking about the innkeeper. All the Bible says is that Mary laid Jesus in a manger. Now I quote, because there was no room for them in the inn. And from that lone verse, we have spun stables and straw and menagerie of barnyard animals and grumpy innkeepers. Whether or not the innkeeper was fictional, I think we all can identify with him because he is so much like us, preoccupied with our own little world so that when Jesus comes, but I don't have time. I don't have room for you. Next up are the shepherds in their butt. Shepherds, not priests, not carpenters. Not shirt-tail royals either, but sheep herders leading lonely lives far from home in the companionship and comfort of home. Most righteous Israelites back then didn't think much of sheep herders because the job was such that to be a good shepherd, you couldn't be a good Jew. You had to be with the sheep. And it was then very difficult to observe the rituals and dietary rules of your faith. And most shepherds accepted that as coming with the territory and got over it. Today, the equivalent of shepherds maybe would be people who have to work on Sunday and can't come to church. It's just the way it is. Or I guess in our parish, Saturday and Sunday. Or during most of the year, Thursday and Sunday. Some people just can't get here because they got to go to work. Well, it's to those people who are a little lackadaisical about the faith that God sends his angels. And suddenly over the fields of Bethlehem, an angel of the Lord appears and the glory of the Lord shones around them and the Bible says those shepherds' butts were terrified. Two T's. And why wouldn't they be terrified? They were in the presence of a holy being. Multitudes of them. And that holiness made them feel guilty, not just for the ham sandwiches they occasionally packed in their lunchbox, but also for the little white lies and the accommodations, and the reservations, and the objections they had to being more serious about the faith. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. Apparently even angels had butts on the first Christmas. But what was behind their butts was different. Behind their butt was not the tired resignation and stubbornness of old men, not the deep down guilt of sinful shepherds, not the preoccupation of a small, small business owner, not even the heartbreak of Mary's bridegroom. Behind the butt of these angels over the field of Bethlehem was good news. Good news that God had said, go tell those people that today a Savior is born to them. He is Christ the Lord. And that good news changed everybody's butt right away. The shepherd's terror turned to joy instantly. And with thanksgiving and celebration, instead of fear and loathing, 
They said, let's go to Bethlehem and see. And they did, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And then they spread the word to everybody, unafraid of what they might think. They just told them what they had seen. Joseph also had an angel take his butt away with this good news. In a dream, an angel said, that baby really is from the Holy Spirit. He is your Savior. And when Joseph woke up, he immediately took Mary as his wife and provided and cared for her as a loving husband. Old Zachariah, though, his big old butt took nine months to go away. Sometimes old dogs do take longer to learn new tricks, don't they? But eventually, when he insisted that his new baby boy be named John, his butt disappeared. Not tonight. I hope. You shouldn't. It's Christmas. But probably in the next few days or the next week or so, you're going to try to look at your butt or your gut and say, you know what, in 2014, I've got to do something about this. Time will tell. And so will the bathroom scales, whether you are successful in taking care of your caboose. But in case you're confused, that's not the butt we've been talking about tonight. We've been talking about what our British friend said that everybody has but can't see. A butt, one T. Our own objections and reservations, doubts, accommodations are hard to see, just like your backside is. But hopefully tonight in these people from the first Christmas, you saw your stubbornness in what it looked like on someone else. You saw your preoccupation and what it looked like on someone else, your heartbreak and what it looks like on someone else, your guilt and what it looks like on someone else, and I hope you've come to the conclusion, i got to do something about that because that's no good for me and no good for God. Step one in getting rid of your butt is admitting you have to get rid of it. Step two is not getting down to the spiritual gym and busting your butt two T's to get rid of your spiritual butt one T and somehow whip yourself into spiritual shape. Thank God that's not step two because what is it now? Seven, eight, ten years now? You've been resolving to get rid of your caboose and it's still there. Holy smokes. Step two in getting rid of our butts is simply to believe that the very heart of Christmas is true. That God Almighty has found a way to be with you and me no matter how big our butts are. And that way is not a method or a dictum, but rather that baby born to Mary in a stable so long ago. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He has come to take away everything that's behind our objections and our doubts and our reservations about God. And you know how he did that? He took what was at the heart of them away. The guilt of our sins and the fear we have of dying. That's what he took away. And because of that, we don't have to object anymore. Because of that, we know God loves us forever and ever. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You can take that to the bank. So this Christmas 2013, just believe 
that in Jesus Christ, God has successfully found a way to be with you forever and start watching your butt melt away. But if you're still concerned about that butt with two T's, then you're going to have to push away from the cookies and pass up some of the desserts this weekend. That's just the way it is. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.